Hello, everyone. I am sitting here with Dr. Jed Fahey, who is an assistant professor and a clinical biochemist here at Johns Hopkins. Jed played a huge role in discovering that broccoli sprouts contain very high amounts of the precursor to sulforaphane called glucoraphanin. Since then, he has made huge contributions to the field uh, and has, has studied sulforaphane and glucoraphanin and broccoli sprouts and from everything from cancer to the microbiome to the brain. So I'm very excited to have a conversation with him today. So Jed, uh, maybe you can sort of kick it off by telling people a little bit about what glucoraphanin and sulforaphane is and some of the history behind discovering it. Sure, be happy to. So um, sulforaphane is a small molecule uh, that was discovered in broccoli by Paul Talale and Yushin Zhang, his student at the time in 1992 or so. They published on it. Um, and it was, it was of interest in particular because it was a huge inducer of protective enzymes in, uh, in people. Um, of course, it wasn't known that this occurred in people at the time, but in cell cultures and in animals, they showed that it upregulated the protective enzyme, cytoprotective enzyme system known by some as the phase two enzyme system. Um, and Paul then, uh, who is one of the grandfathers of chemoprotection, um, and has, it really helped make uh, people stand up and pay attention to the fact that you could p potentially prevent diseases like cancer. Paul asked me to join the group in 1993, and the challenge was, can, can you get broccoli with, with more uh, sulforaphane? Um, I came from a background in plant biotechnology, and um, of course, I said yes. We should be able to, and we started trying to trying to breed and cross broccolis to get to, to get higher levels of sulforaphane. Quickly became obvious that it was very difficult to predict how much sulforaphane a broccoli plant would have, um, uh, based on things like smell, touch, color. And you pretty much had to run it through an, an HPLC to measure levels of sulforaphane. What's more is we realized that um, sulforaphane is not what's present in the intact plant. So what's present in the plant is something called glucoraphanin, and that is a thioglucose conjugated uh, molecule, um, not to get too heavily into the biochemistry of it, but um, it's a bigger molecule, it's a precursor, and it's very stable. Sulforaphane's not at all stable, it's highly reactive. Um, and so, at any rate, it, it turned out that the, the intact broccoli plants had, a lo had glucoraphane at various levels, ranged all over the map, couldn't figure out exactly how much one had without doing chemical analyses. Um, and we were going out to the field in the eastern shore of Maryland, and um, eventually winter came along, and we couldn't go out to the, sh to the fields and get broccoli anymore. So we started growing them in incubators in the lab, starting from seeds. And lo and behold, it turns out that broccoli sprouts had much higher levels of, sulfur, of the precursor of sulforaphane, glucoraphanin, than did the, the mature plants, the, the heads of broccoli that you buy in the market. Um, so we then determined that if you grow broccoli sprouts all the same way, which you pretty much do if you're a home sprouter or a commercial sprouter, you add a certain amount of light, you add fresh water, you grow them for a certain amount of time at a certain temperature. So if you did that with a whole slew of different cultivars, that's the different sub-varieties of broccoli, you got a range of different activities, different amounts of glucoraphanin. Anyway, bottom line is by selecting the appropriate genotypes, the appropriate broccoli genetics, if you will, um, we identified some varieties that had very high levels of glucoraphanin. Um, we made a, Paul and I made a conscious decision at that time that we were going to promote the use of broccoli sprouts, not broccoli seeds, because it turns out the seeds have the highest amount on a per gram basis of glucoraphanin. But at the time, no one had eaten broccoli seeds. You know, they weren't green. They didn't have the sort of cachet or the appearance of, uh, you know, eating healthy green vegetables. 
So we focused on sprouts, which had much higher levels than the mature plants, although lower levels than the seeds. And it turns out that then there is an enzyme that the plant tissue contains called myrosinase. And that enzyme converts glucoraphanin, the precursor, which is stored in vacuoles in the plant cells, to sulforaphane. And typically in nature, the plant does that as a protective mechanism. Um, if an insect starts chewing on the leaf of a broccoli plant, for example, it breaks open cells, right? And so those cells then release their glucoraphanin and the enzyme that's present at the same site hydrolyzes glucoraphanin and forms sulforaphane. And sulforaphane repels those bugs or is in some cases toxic to those bugs. Um, so they go and they fly away or they crawl away. Um, uh, but it turns out that sulforaphane um, is also a foreign, a foreign compound for our cells, um, but in the process of being recognized and chucked out of the cell, if you will, um, it upregulates the protective enzymes in those cells. Um, and so that's why it's so special. Like a um, hormetic effect, like a hormetic uh, effect. Where it's yeah, yeah. So clearly you could, you could if you... If all you ate was sulforaphane, you'd be in, you know, you'd be in, you'd be in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the same, you know, the same with just about anything you can, you can suggest. So it's, it, it gears up or it cranks up the protective mechanisms of the cells. Um, and one of those, I guess, that one of the main uh, protective mechanisms would be the NRF2 pathway. Yeah. So I, I, I have a feeling that sulforaphane would be just another interesting phytochemical if at almost the same time we, and I use the term we loosely because I was only very peripherally involved with this, but a number of people at Johns Hopkins and in Japan discovered, and um, in Japan and England I should say, but a small number of people discovered this NRF2 pathway and really fleshed out all the details of it. Um, and this happened in parallel to the interest in sulforaphane and broccoli. Um, and it turns out that the NRF2 pathway is an extremely important pathway for upregulating the protective enzymes um, and protective proteins, uh, including perhaps the heat shock proteins in cells um, so that they can protect themselves against various insults. It's an integral part of uh, protection against a variety of chronic diseases. Um, and as I say, um, you know, Tom Kensler, and Paul Talalay, Albana Dunkova Kostova, all at Hopkins, uh, Masi Yamamoto in Japan, um, John Hayes in England, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm certainly leaving out a few people, but small number of people initially put this pathway on the map. And it turns out that the NRF2 pathway um, controls something between three and five percent of our cellular proteins. So it's very important. Wow, I didn't path. realize it was that much. Yeah, and and you know why is it important? It's important because um, it recognizes molecules like sulforaphane um, through uh, a, a system, a biochemical system that I hesitate to to explain without props and graphs, <laughs> um, and also because I'm not the world's expert on this certainly, but. Um, it recognizes sulforaphane or other similar molecules as they enter cells um, in the cytoplasm of the cells. Um, then there, there is actually a chaperone protein that's in the cytoplasm, it's called KEEP1. That molecule, when it binds to sulforaphane or vice versa, um, changes in conformation and it releases NRF2 um, which then migrates to the nucleus and turns on or, or upregulates um, the antioxidant response element, which is responsible for, for the transcription, for initiating transcription of a whole series of, of protective genes or genes encoding for a bunch of protective enzymes. So um, it's a, and this happens very quickly, this, this um, uh, uh, protective response. Um, and it's quite efficient. So uh, to get back to sulforaphane, sort of sulforaphane was discovered and then everybody started searching for the mechanism by which it acted. NRF2, the, the KEEP1 NRF2 mechanism was discovered 
And they sort of both developed a following, if you will, in parallel. And it turns out that sulforaphane is still probably the most potent activator of NRF2 uh, to be found naturally, in, in, you know, from, from the natural world. There have been synthetic activators that are more potent that, that have been, um, been produced, been made uh, chemically. But sulforaphane still sort of takes the, takes the cake in terms of its protective ability and ability to upregulate protective enzymes. I should, you know, when I give lectures to students, I frequently make the, the point out to them how they're doing this glucoraphane into sulforaphane conversion. So uh, I'll, I'll do it for this webinar. Um, when you chew on a, on a red radish, you're familiar with the fact that the first sensation is cool and crunchy, and then within 20, 30 seconds, um, you develop heat. You start tearing, your nose starts running, it has a lacrimating effect. Um, so what you're doing is you're, you're acting like that, that insect that I told you lands on the leaf of a broccoli plant. You're breaking the plant cells by crunching on the radish. You're releasing, you're releasing a compound that's very, very similar to glucoraphin, and it's actually called glucoraphinine in radishes. Um, it happens to be more of a lacrimator. It's got a more mucus inducing effect in people. Um, and you're letting myrosinase in those radish tissues act on glucoraphanine and form sulforaphene and some other related isothiocyanates. That's the broad uh, name for that category. So it happens that fast um, when you chew on fresh vegetables that contain this system. Does sulforaphene also activate NRF2? It does, but to a lesser degree than degree. sulforaphane. So many of these and isothiocyanates also activate NRF2, but not to the same degree as sulforaphane. They do. And just in case you're about to ask me, you, you find this system. It's, it's been dubbed the mustard, the mustard oil bomb by, by some 20 or 30 years ago. You find this system in almost exclusively in cruciferous vegetables. Right. Or brassica vegetables or coal crops, they're sometimes called, depending upon where you come from, where you hail from. In Eastern Europe, they typically call them coal crops. Um, so this happens to be a, a very large family of, I don't know, five or 600 uh, genera, many, many thousands of species. Yeah, I know like maybe 10 of them. <laughs> well, we. No, maybe 20, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, there, there, are, there are very many of them. And they grow worldwide, although the brassica or the coal crops that we're familiar with in the United States are all uh, temperate climate crops. Um, they, 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 they're common to areas where there's a, a, you know, a freeze, a cold winter or a freeze in the winter. Um, there are some interesting relatives we can talk about later or now, if you'd like. Um, uh, which are tropical. Um, Moringa is the one which has gotten most attention recently and we've been interested in for about 20 years. Um, it's, it's a relative of broccoli, but it's a tropical plant. It's actually a tree. And it too has this system of glucosinolate, myrosinase, and isothiocyanate. The former being the storage form in the plant, um, the latter being the, the biologically active uh, form. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe we can get to that a little bit later, but talk a little bit more about the um, the sulforaphane and, and yep. the broccoli sprouts. Yep. I, I wanted to ask you something because you mentioned it, it really piqued my attention. And that is, you said that broccoli seeds actually mm -hmm. had a higher amount of glucoraphanin than the sprout. Mm -hmm. um, is it, if, if I were to say take those broccoli seeds, because I sprout, if I were to take those mm -hmm. broccoli seeds, add a little water and blend them in a blender, mm -hmm. Would that activate myrosinase within the seed, the crushing of the seed? You bet. It, so it, I could it, actually it get a higher, more potent amount of sulforaphane, theoretically, if I were to just take the seeds? And because, yes. man, that would yeah. be easier than sprouting, uh, in that's, a way. That's true. So in, interestingly, um, you know, when, when we discovered that and this was this was published in 1997, so it's ancient history. You're, it's probably before you were born, right? <laughs> but, um, so, when we discovered that broccoli sprouts and seeds were such a potent source of, of sulforaphane, or its precursor, um, 
we weren't aware that anybody had eaten broccoli seeds. People eat, you know, all sorts of seeds, poppy seeds and rape seed seeds or too. canola seed, in fact, are used to express oil, and they're a close relative. But, but no one had eaten broccoli seeds. And when we tried them, you know, they're, they're quite mm -hmm. bitter. Mm -hmm. um, but interestingly, if you, if you bake them just gently, don't scorch them, if you bake them, they get, they're a very nutty taste. And they're, they're sort of pleasant tasting. The problem is if you bake them, you kill the enzyme, you oh. kill myrosinase. Right, or, so that's because a it's important a pro right, right. It's Yeah, so, um, so you, uh, there actually have been some epidemiologic studies, um, and I'm getting off topic a bit, but some epidemiologic studies suggesting that um, people who eat certain amounts of cruciferous vegetables have reduced risks of various cancers. Breast cancer and lung cancer are, are high on the list of cancers that have been studied. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it turns out that if you eat raw cruciferous vegetables, you're a bit better protected, again, based on the epidemiology. This, isn't the, this has not been the subject of interventions um, uh, of, of uh, uh, randomized com uh, clinical trials, for example. But it looks like um, the protective effect is greater if you eat raw vegetables. Mm -hmm. But now a lot of people don't like to eat raw, you know, cauliflower or broccoli or, or well, radishes they do. But um, uh, so at any rate, um, you asked about the content in broccoli seeds, and indeed they have much more sulf much more glucoraphanin, and they have plenty of active myrosinase. Um, but I, I have a feeling, I've never made a b smoothie from broccoli from raw broccoli seeds. I have a feeling it'd be pretty bitter. I'll let um, you know, because I'm going to try it. I thought you might. <laughs> but you made a really 